Hey guys, how's it going? Today I want to talk about 11 ornamental berry producing plants for a beautiful winter landscape. And this whole thought came about uh, to talk about this subject when I was walking around our garden the other day getting ready to put together a fall arrangement. And this time of year when we're kind of coming off of cut flower season, we don't have the dahlias and the roses, zinnias, all those big showy flowers to fall back on. So naturally you're looking at your flower beds with more of a critical eye, like what still looks pretty this time of year? What things bloom really late in the season that can take the cold, what kind of seed heads look really interesting, and most importantly, which ones produce beautiful berries that I can tuck into a flower vase. Um, so I just thought it would be a really fun opportunity to talk about some of those things that I'm gonna be adding into my own flower beds because I have a lot of opportunity to really amp up my fall and winter display. So these 11 plants are actually 11 categories that can be broken down further into specific varieties. And the fun thing about berry producing plants is where there is a berry, there once was a bloom because you had to have a bloom uh, there present earlier in the year to then turn into a berry. So most of these plants will produce more than one season of interest. Most of the time they'll produce three or four seasons of interest because all of these will hold their berries throughout the winter months. So the first category are crab apple trees, which is hands down my favorite group of ornamental trees to tuck into any landscape. They come in so many different varieties, which means they come in a ton of different sizes. You can start with one like a lollipop crab apple is a wonderful variety. I had four of in our last garden that only grow eight to 10 feet tall and they maintain a very tidy formal appearance. They have red berries through the winter. Uh, but they're just a beautiful type just to tuck into a smaller garden space. But then you can get them all the way up to shade producing crab apple trees if you have the space for it that grow 30 feet tall and wide. Uh, we have a beautiful variety in our front yard called, I think it's a Donald Wyman. It was here when we moved in, but the most glorious show of white blooms in the spring. It's just absolutely stunning. And then it's got, I mean, cast beautiful shade throughout the year and then beautiful red berries throughout the winter months. And it's just loaded up right now. I can see it out our front window. But crabapple trees in general are very low maintenance. They don't require a lot from you. They attract pollinators in the spring when they're blooming and then they provide forage for wildlife throughout the winter months. And they also offer all kinds of different variations. So not just size wise, but you can get um, varieties that have different colors of leaves during the growing season. So you can get a tree that has green leaves or a tree that has purple leaves or somewhere right in between. You can get those that bloom white or that bloom bright, showy pink. We have a variety I just planted this spring called Showtime and it's got dark like uh, burgundy leaves that turn orange in the fall, bright red berries, but the blooms on that one are like a bright neon pink. I can't wait to see that tree mature. I think it's gonna be really beautiful, but you can also get different colors of berries too. So maybe you want one that has white blooms and then provides red berries, or maybe you want one that has white blooms and produces yellow berries. I shouldn't say berries. They are technically crab apples, but there's just so many to choose from. It's a really fun, group of plants. And a couple other varieties of crab apple I wanted to mention that I have personal experience with, and I'll list uh, in all of these categories, varieties that I know of and have grown and things like that. Uh, but there's a variety of crab apple called Sugar Time that was always one of the first ones to sell out in the spring at the garden center. Beautiful uh, white flowers in the spring loaded, like the tree would be loaded with blooms, uh, followed by red fruit that would stay on all the way through the winter until the tree was blooming again. Um, so a one word that you can look for on a uh, plant tag right by its berry description is the word persistent. If a tree has persistent berries, that means that tree will hang on to those berries uh, and usually the birds clean them up instead of like having the berries fall or the crab apples rather fall on the ground and make a mess. I find though that even crab apples that don't have the word persistent on them, as long as they're the small ornamental type of crab apple, they don't tend to make a, a mess because the birds slick them up, they clean them up super quick. If you're going for a more traditional type crab apple like that you can actually eat and use to preserve and things like that, those tend to act a little bit differently. But my parents have a variety in their garden that's glorious right now. It's called Red Jewel. And it grows a tiny bit bigger than lollipop. I think 12 to 15 feet tall, maybe 12 feet wide or so. But it also kind of maintains more of a round appearance in its canopy. It has probably one of the heaviest sets of fruit I have ever seen on a tree that lasts all throughout the winter months. And when you've got snow in the ground and those bright red berries, it's quite the show. And then the last variety I wanted to mention is called Indian Magic. And my in-laws actually have this crab apple tree planted right outside their dining room window. And it doesn't matter what time of year we're there, it's always gorgeous. I mean, beautiful pink blooms in the spring. It's got a really neat, like, um, 
like wider appearance. It's got a wider than a tall appearance, if that makes sense. So it kind of looks like a little bit more architectural. And then it's got orange fall color and then gorgeous heavy load of berries throughout the fall and winter months. The second category are coral berries, which the botanical name is Symphoric Harpus. Uh, they are a shrub that's, I think, vastly underused in the garden. I think a lot more gardens need to have this plant. They produce arching stems with sprays, loads of pink berries, which is such a unique thing to see this time of year. I mean, this morning we had little flurries of snow and then I could see my coral berries, just pink berries, just shining with this little dusting of snow coming down. And it was just such a beautiful sight. And we're so used to seeing yellow berries or red berries that pink is a nice variation. The nice thing about coral berries is that they could thrive on neglect. Who doesn't like that <laughs> to have something that's super tough in their garden space. Um, and they also like the traditional varieties will want to kind of naturalize themselves, but there's a variety I'm familiar with called Proudberry. I have that planted in my garden and it stays on the smaller side. So three to four feet tall and wide. It's not gonna spread itself around. My parents have a hedge of them as well. And they just load up with fruit. They can handle more crummy soil. Like they can take our high pH here. They're just a wonderful uh, plant that the birds also like. They bloom kind of midsummer. Uh, the blooms are fairly insignificant. You don't really notice those as much as you notice the big load of berries that the birds will end up cleaning up as well. One other thing about that one, other than the fact that it's also super cold tolerant, is that the berries last for a really long time as a cut uh, flower. So if you use it, or a cut branch rather, because it's not a flower. If you cut a branch and put some of those berries in an arrangement, um, they last a long time before they start to want to drop off. And that's not always the case with every type of berry branch. The third category are hawthorn trees, which is another great big group of plants. There are so many different varieties. Um, I have one that's called a Russian hawthorn in our garden that is looking incredibly spectacular right now. It's a smaller growing hawthorn, about 15 feet tall, eight feet wide. I love trees that will stay narrow. Those are a little bit harder to come by. So to find one that only wants to, you know, max out at eight feet, that's easy to tuck into a flower bed. It's a zone four. Right now it's got its fall color going on, which is kind of this amber yellow. And the leaves have a very distinct shape. I mean, the very distinct hawthorn shape. Uh, and then a little bit larger size red berries. I planted this tree a couple of years ago and I haven't cut any branches on it until this last week because I wanted to have give it a chance to bulk up a little bit. Um, it was one of those down at the nursery that had been there for a while and I needed to kind of recuperate its health a little bit. So I let it just sit there and this is the first fall. It was such a treat to just go cut three little <laughs> branches off of it and use it in my arrangement that I just made. These also bloom in the spring, big clusters of bloom. Uh, and they will all differ a little bit depending on the variety. So the Russian, Russian hawthorn blooms white followed by red berries. There are a couple varieties of thornless hawthorns. That's one thing you do need to kind of be mindful of depending on where you want to put your tree. Hawthorns do have thorns, but the thornless varieties that I'm aware of, there's one called a uh, crusader. It's a variety that I don't have in my own garden yet. I'm hoping to add it this next year, but it's got gorgeous orange fall color uh, with bright, bright red berries. And then there's another variety called crimson cloud that's thornless. And this one, it's a little bit bigger of a tree, like it grows 20 to 25 feet tall and wide, which I guess you could categorize as like a medium sized tree. Um, but the blooms on this one are very unique in that they are pink, like a very vivid pink with a white center. And then they're followed by red berries. Number four are roses, rose hips specifically, which are the little berry looking seed heads that a rose produces if you don't deadhead the blooms. Um, a lot of times we don't see rose hips form in our garden because we're keeping our roses deadheaded because you know, it does look tidier and cleaner for the rose plant to have the spent blooms cut off. Um, and there are some varieties that won't really produce rose, uh, rose hips, um, but a lot of varieties will. And there are certain varieties. I have one called Morden Blush. I typically stop deadheading right around the, around the beginning of August. And I let all of the, the blooms that happen after that point turn into rose hips. And it will depend on what variety you have, what the hips look like. They could be like kind of elongated, maybe smallish, some are huge. And they'll range from like a yellowish orange to a deep red, sometimes a bright red. And they're beautiful to work into decor. And I think another reason why we sometimes don't leave rose hips there to form is that they do draw energy away from the plant as do all berries and um, things like that. When a plant is trying to produce seed and produce berries and perpetuate itself, it's sending a tremendous amount of energy into forming that specific fruit. 
Um, so it takes energy away from producing more blooms or more foliar growth and uh, what have you. But with roses, I find that when you keep your roses going through the season, you can deadhead normally, but then at the kind of like late part of the season, you can stop doing that, stop deadheading. I find that it doesn't hurt my roses at all but it gives us an extra layer of beauty throughout the winter months. So I've got a lot of roses out in our landscape that produce really beautiful hips for me. At last, I've got a lot of English roses, um, a lot of landscape roses will produce them. Uh, the Rugosa or wild roses are most definitely the most, uh, produce the most heavy set of hips, but the uh, Rugosas are typically a very large growing rose and they bloom, have a very short bloom season in the spring. They're glorious when in bloom but I actually don't have any of those in my own yard specifically. And we may add some more out in our bigger space here in the years to come. Number five are junipers, which here in our area, in Eastern Oregon high desert, junipers are a native here. They do exceptionally well. They don't require anything from us. Typically, they're a really good substitute. If you have a hard time with arborvitas or you deal with deer, uh, junipers are really good deer resistant substitution. We've got a few really old junipers here in our garden that produce really gorgeous berries, but there's a new variety that I've been planting. I started planting it last year. It's called Gin Fizz that produces an exceptionally heavy load of bright blue icy berries, which are fantastic to use in arrangements. I just love to tuck those in along with white roses and like eucalyptus, it looks so beautiful. So that variety grows about 18 feet tall and 10 feet wide, which is a fairly good size evergreen. Definitely not in your like Colorado blue spruce category that gets 60 feet tall and 40 feet wide, um, but they've got this really pleasing pyramidal shape that looks very clean and tidy, which I do appreciate in some plants. I like to have um, a very, Nice contrast of different structures of evergreen, and they look incredibly beautiful with a dusting of snow. Number six are viburnums, which is another huge group of plants, tons of different varieties to choose from, and very versatile. I find that they're very adaptable to different light situations and different soil situations as well. And you can get varieties like ones called Lil Diddy, which grow one to two feet tall and wide, so super easy to tuck into a small space all the way up to varieties that resemble small trees growing anywhere from 10 to 15 tall and wide. Um, so it just depends on your size of garden and what kind of structure you want and what kind of area, um, but you'll have variations in bloom color, uh, leaf structure and berry color. I planted a variety called Brandywine this year, which I'm very excited to see grow. It's got beautiful uh, kind of longer leaves that are very thick, deep green, glossy. The fall color is just out of this world. That's the other thing with viburnums. They usually, most varieties will produce the most amazing show in the fall. So you have your spring blooms, your fall color, and then berries that typically last through the winter. So you really almost don't skip a season of interest with this type of plant. Same goes for a lot of these. The other cool thing about Brandywine is that it does not require a pollinating type of uh, viburnum nearby in order to get berries. There are some varieties that just, so just be aware, check the tag, that do need a pollinator nearby, which means that um, if they don't have a pollinator nearby, they will bloom for you, but they won't set berries. Um, so you need to make sure you either have a variety that can do it all on its own or that you get the accompanying variety so you make sure to get your berries. A couple of other really beautiful varieties that I wanna put in my own garden. There's one called Tandoori Orange, the most gorgeous clusters of bright orange berries. Um, there's Blue Muffin that has very uh, bright blue, very clear blue uh, clusters of berries, and then Cardinal Candy that has bright red berries. Number seven are Pyracantha, also called Firethorn. Absolutely gorgeous plant, glossy green leaves. Some are evergreen, some are not, so that's something to be mindful of. They do have thorns that are pretty wicked, I'm not gonna lie, but they are totally worth growing. Um, you can use them as a hedging plant. There are some varieties that stay lower that you can use as a ground cover. They're very adaptable to just kind of crummy soil like ours, high pH, and they are very water wise. So if you have a spot that stays dry that you would just like something that's beautiful, this would be a really good one. And like maybe pairing it alongside denim and lace Russian sage, having the orange berries with the late blue blooms, I think it would be very beautiful. Or like a caryopteris beyond midnight. I think that would be a beautiful pairing as well. I might need to do that somewhere in my garden. I've also seen people train pyracantha on a wall, like in a grid pattern. It's so beautiful when they're full of orange berries. And I even have two spiraled pyracanthas in containers near our gazebo. Number eight are cotoneasters, which don't ever feel bad if you accidentally call it cotton Easter in the beginning, because I think everybody has done that. It looks exactly like the words cotton Easter, but it's actually pronounced cotoneaster. And they are mostly a lower growing type of shrub. 
that produce very fine glossy green looking leaves and they have very delicate looking white blooms in the spring followed by bright red berries throughout the fall and winter months. There's a variety called Little Dipper that grows about 12 inches tall. That's where it tops out at and then it'll grow out a few feet. So a really beautiful like kind of ground hugging type of a shrub that's great along borders like along walkways maybe hugging the base of a rock. It's not a steppable. It's not like a the type of ground cover you can step on, um, but it's definitely something that looks beautiful, uh, just kind of mixed in with some other things along the edge of a border. I actually think that that would be a really fun one to try in a container sometime. Like if you could find a really nice potted a little dipper Cotone Aster that you could put out the front of a container in, in the winter time and enjoy those red berries uh, kind of as your spiller plant, I think that would be a really unique look. Category number nine are Calicarpa or beauty berries. Now, the first time I ever saw one of these beauty berries was when we were in England touring estate gardens. I saw this beautiful shrub with clusters of purple berries. I had no idea what it was. I had to find out because, oh my word, so beautiful. Now we're kind of going into the realm, these last three categories of plants that I think like more acidic soil. I'm not positive about Calicarpa, but I have planted some in our garden that struggled. And so I'm really gonna be working on amending some of our areas heavily to create a little bit more of a neutral to maybe, I don't ever think I'll get our soil on the acidic side of the, on the pH scale, but something a little bit closer to neutral so that I can get Calicarpa to grow because I think it's gonna be absolutely worth the effort. There's a variety called Pearl Glam. This, this shrub looks beautiful all the time. Beautiful dark stems with purple leaves and then thick clusters of purple berries in the fall. So it's kind of like the coral berry having the pink berries and then you have your beauty berries with the purple. It just provides something so unique to the fall and winter garden. And that variety actually stays a little bit smaller than some of the traditional kind of more wild varieties that you might find. I think it grows about four feet tall is where it tops out and maybe three to four feet wide, somewhere right around in there. Kind of on the smaller to medium size of shrub and I think they're a zone five through eight. They also bloom on new wood, which is always a very comforting thing. <laughs> when you live in an area where you can sometimes have some fairly severe cold snaps that tend to winter kill things, to know that that shrub will still produce new growth that will both bloom and produce berries the next year is always a nice feeling. And this one does not require a pollinator. So you plant a pearl glam and you will get the berries and the blooms and the whole shoot and match. The a really interesting thing about Calicarpa, and I don't know if this is true, this is just like a little fact, that I read is that they are supposed, supposedly they have some mosquito repelling qualities and that's how they're used largely, that's what they're used largely for in the South. So you can plant a bunch of Calicarpa to help keep the mosquitoes away. So the last two categories of plants, number 10 and 11, are winterberry hollies and blue hollies, both of which do like the pH of your soil to be more on the neutral to acidic side of things. Um, so they do want to struggle a little bit in our environment. However, I did plant three winterberry hollies last fall. They made it through their first season. They're still very small, but they have berries on them, so I'm very hopeful. Um, but both of these plants offer something really different and unique. Most of these types of hollies, now there may be some exceptions, there may be some varieties I'm not aware of, but most of them are dioecious, which means that uh, one plant will only produce one type of bloom. So you'll have a plant that's a female that will produce berries or a plant that's a male that will produce flowers. And you do need to have a male and female variety both in your garden in order to get the berries on your female plant. So like with the winter berry, berry hollies I planted, I think I planted berry poppins was my female variety and so I planted a Mr. Poppins and Mr. Poppins I just kind of tucked into the back because since he doesn't produce berries, he'll produce little, little blooms but if you have a male variety within 50 feet of your females, then one male will, will pollinate up to five female varieties and then you'll get your berries. The really unique thing about winterberry hollies is that they are deciduous so they lose their leaves in the fall which means that you get to see all of those berries very, very clearly. They're not shrouded by any kind of leaf canopy. They're just like, they just grow thick on the branches and that's what you get to see through the winter time. Um, winterberry hollies are also very adaptable in wet soil situations, which is what we have where I planted them. And that was kind of one of my reasonings for putting them in, even though I knew my pH was high. I thought, well, they'll like the amount of moisture they get in this spot. So if I can add some soil acidifier in and be on it with that sort of thing, maybe I can keep these plants happy, but it's always nice to have an option for more wet areas in your garden and they're super tough in the winter. I think like the berry poppins varieties is zone three through nine. I mean, that's crazy. We live in a zone 
six now. Um, so definitely are tough enough to survive our winters. And I use a ton of these branches in holiday projects in containers, in wreaths, in garlands, I mean, you name it, they are perfect and they last forever. Um, so I've used Berry Heavy Berry Poppins. There's also one called Berry Heavy Gold, which I don't have planted in my garden yet, but I would love to have because they produce beautiful kind of mustardy yellow uh, berries that are very unique. And then our last category is the blue holly, which are like your traditional type hollies that are evergreen, that have the classic holly shaped leaves. Again, these plants do need a male and female. You need one of both. So like Castle Spire is a really neat variety that has more of a conical appearance as it grows. It stays very, um, like it lends itself to a formal space because of its growth habit, but you, you do need to plant like a variety called Castle Wall, which is your male variety. And you can tuck that one back away if you want so that you can make sure to get berries on that castle spire. And because of its growth habit, I feel like it's a perfect specimen for containers because I love like boxwoods that have that conical shape or hollies that have that conical shape. If you plant it in the landscape, I mean, it'll grow, I think up to 10 feet tall and around four feet wide in so zone five through seven. And I'm not 100% positive. There may be some varieties within both of those categories of holly that can produce both your blooms and your berries on the same plant. I'm not aware of any that are like popping into my head, but I haven't like researched the whole realm of hollies out there. I do know that a lot of times when you go to a garden center and buy a holly, um, they will plant both a male and female in the same pot together. So that's something you can check. If it doesn't indicate on the tag that you need to have a separate male plant, look inside that can and you may see two trunks coming out from the center. Um, in which case a lot of times they plant a male and female together, which I don't think is necessarily healthy for the, the plant because the plants want to get naturally larger and you'll end up with, with pieces of the plant that don't have any berries and pieces that do. That's why I like doing like the berry poppins separate from my Mr. Poppins because then I know my whole berry poppins is gonna be full of berries like uniformly, if that makes sense. And the last thing I wanted to mention just about the two holly plants is that large amounts of those berries can be toxic to pets. So if you have a dog or a cat that likes to eat on your plants outside, definitely like um, make sure that you've got those type of plants up in containers or something like that if it's something that you really want. Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. And that is it, you guys. That is my list of 11 berry producing plants for a beautiful winter landscape. All of these things, the specific varieties that I've mentioned, I either have had experience with, I've grown myself, I've seen my parents grow, or there's a few varieties that I want to put in my garden as soon as I can get my hands on them. So I hope this has given you guys some things to think about through these winter months as you're looking at your own flower beds and deciding where you maybe could use a little bit of interest. All of these things are wonderful to use in cut arrangements and holiday projects. And that just kind of brings an extra layer of fun in it for me anyway. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and we will see you in the next one. Bye.